Hello, I'm Lakeisha Bennett, and you're listening to the MetaVance podcast series. They're the federal regulations governing the confidentiality of drug and alcohol abuse treatment and prevention records. We're talking about 42 CFR Part 2, which is commonly referred to as Part 2. Now, by definition, Part 2 applies to all records relating to the identity, diagnosis, (laughs) prognosis, or treatment of any patient in a substance abuse program that's conducted, regulated, or directly or indirectly assisted by any department or agency of the United States. Now, recently, there have been proposed revisions to the regulation. So here to help us break everything down and um, try to explain what this all means is CEO and founder of HIPAA-TREC, Sarah Bottoman. Thank you for joining us, Sarah. Thank you, Lakeisha. It's nice to have for me to be on again. Awesome. So um, firstly, can you just tell us, um, for those who aren't familiar with uh, 42 CFR Part 2, um, what is Part 2 exactly? So Part 2 is concerned with the confidentiality of substance use disorder patients, uh, their records, so and how those records can be disclosed to other providers, um, how you need to access them, and so forth. So basically, if you think about it in the terms of HIPAA, um, it's the privacy of all the records um, regarding any patient that is being treated for a substance use disorder. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, I guess as it relates to um, of HIPAA, um, actually there are revisions that um, were published in early February of this year, 2016. Can you just tell us about some of the major changes that have come up? Yeah, so it's really exciting. This is our first substantial change to Part 2 since the 1980s. So it's it's time to modernize Part 2. And so some of the, the biggest changes that are happening is even just the name of of part two is changing. It is currently called the confidentiality of alcohol and drug abuse patients. Um, However, alcohol and drug abuse is no longer a term that is utilized in the industry. It has been replaced with the favored substance abuse disorder. Um, And then so the title of part two is going to be changed to the confidentiality of substance use disorder patient records. So that starts to bring us into, um, that starts the modernization um, process that these new revisions are are trying to achieve. Um, It also is going to allow through revisions to how consents are are going to be handled. Um, It's going to allow the modernization even further by allowing patients to participate um, in um, health information exchanges and ACOs or accountable care organizations. Um, It's also going to allow for um, the use of electronic um, records, um, which are already being utilized, but it does give now provisions for how to maintain those records in a private and secure manner. Um, it makes references a, a lot back to HIPAA. Um, so, because organizations now that are covered by Part 2 um, also have to comply with HIPAA, but they utilize the Part 2 revisions kind of as a crutch to ignore HIPAA. Um, or the security aspects of of the HIPAA rules. Um, And so now part two is going to specifically address the security of electronic records and how those can be, how those um, should be maintained. Um, So those are kind of in a nutshell, some of the biggest changes that are are happening um, with these new proposed, with these new proposed changes. Okay, um, great. You were talking about um, how it kind of works with HIPAA. Can you just kind of, I guess, tell us a little bit more about how Part 2 and HIPAA are um, complementing each other? Yes, and particularly in um, these new revisions that are going to be coming out, um, the new revisions to Part 2 um, specifically addresses uh, the security of records Um, So these new updates um, include reference to electronic records, whereas the current regulations only refer to paper records. So patients will be permitted to give consent via electronic signature, um, and as well as participate, like I said, in those health information exchanges. And so that being realized, um, SAMHSA understood the need 
for um, organizations to now apply security measures as we are modernizing the treatment of substance abuse patients. Um, so with that, uh, particularly, so if we want to look at the way that um, the sanitation of uh, records that are no longer in use or retiring records, um, so how those are going to be de-identified, um, the new proposals actually um, refers directly to the way that it refers to HIPAA's policies and procedures as well as the framework outlined in the National Institute for the Standardization of Technologies um, or NIST 800-88 security paper. Um, so it'll, it'll tell them exactly how they're supposed to um, de-identify electronic records um, when they're no longer being utilized. So, or to destroy devices that aren't being used any longer. Mm -hmm. So all of that will be now addressed. And it's really exciting, because, and if patients should be excited too, because now that they they know that their their treatment centers are are modernizing, and now they can have a peace of mind that there's rules and regulations that are going to apply directly to that technology to make sure that those treatment centers are are treating them um, in a secure manner. Awesome. Now you're mentioning um, it gives the patients a bit of peace of mind as it relates to their um, their records with the, the treatment programs. How else does it um, kind of make things exciting and a little easier for the patients? I mean, just because it's going to, the consents are changing, which makes it nice for the patients as well. So um, some proposed changes to consents is going to make it easier for the patients to um, designate individuals, entities, or participants or a class of participants for those records to be changed. For example, they can name an individual physician for those records to be going to, or they can say an entire hospital or health clinic's name for those clinics to go to. They can even give a, um, a catch-all my treatment provider um, release statement in their consents for those disclosures. So before patients had to list out, or currently how it is right now, patients have to list out every name of every person or entity that is going to be receiving information about them. And so that process is going to be easier. It's also going to be easier for them to take advantage of health information exchanges, accountable care organizations, by being able to list those um, entities on their consent forms as well for that to be sent in. Um, they'll also have a higher control over the amount and kind of information that is permitted to be disclosed. Um, so they, they, they simply put they have as much control over their substance use disorder records as they, as they will over their regular health records. So there's still a little bit higher of a, of a paperwork standpoint than in HIPAA with mm -hmm. Part 2. Um, however, patients will be gaining that, that piece of control that was lacking, that's currently lacking. Okay. All right. So um, the revisions for Part 2, what does it mean for um, treatment providers? And I guess does this mean... Um, I guess they have to comply um, by a certain time, or like, what does this mean for the providers now? Um, so right now, these are just proposed changes. Um, so right now, treatment providers um, should actually be reviewing these proposed changes. They're listed on the federal registry um, right now, and so they should be being reviewed because it's in an open commentary or a public comment. Um, phase where providers can actually submit comments on the changes um, so that they have a voice and how these, so if there's something in there that they don't necessarily agree with or they want to see something else added, they can actually make those um, comments now mm -hmm. um, so that they have a voice on these regulations. Um, SAMHSA is accepting public comments until April 9th. Um, they can be, public comments can be submitted at um, regulations.gov, and they just follow the submit a comment instructions, um, or when they go to the federal registry and, and read through these proposed changes, there are instructions there 
or how they can actually send by mail a, a, a public comment. Okay. So, um, okay, so right now these are just the revisions and um, like the treatment providers can go over them and kind of, I guess, get any kind of questions answered and everything. I guess, is there a time frame of when this will actually take effect? Um, we don't know yet. Um, we know that public comment is open until April 9th. Um, it typically takes several months for them to um, review and go over those, those comments. Uh, we know that once the, the final rule is effective, um, programs will have 180 days to comply from that effective date. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're probably looking at late this year or early next year for an effective date for this final rule. Okay. And, um, and that, oh, go ahead. As, again, that has not been um, made public, so we don't know exactly when it'll be, because it's still open for comment. Okay. So, um, so not all pro programs are um, subject to the Part 2 regulations. Can you tell us, like, what types of programs that uh, actually do fall under this regulation? And so federally assisted programs um, fall under um, the Part 2 regulations. Um, there are some changes to the definition of a program that is proposed in these, in these revisions as well. Um, I think that every treatment facility would just need to do an individual analysis to determine whether or not they are, are regulated under Part 2. But for the most part, um, if you are a treatment facility, um, you are more than likely are a Part 2 covered program. Um, Generally speaking, um, Part 2 regulations do not apply to general medical practices, just as it does not apply to general medical facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, a program is, is defined as an individual or an entity that holds itself out to be providing substance use disorder diagnosis. It's identified uh, or an identified unit within a general medical facility um, that's providing substance use disorder treatment or a medical our medical personnel um, that's providing those treatments. Um, and again, they all have to be federally assisted, um, which could be even just um, billing Medicare or Medicaid would qualify as federally assisted. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. This is some uh, great information for uh, the treatment providers that um, do fall under this uh, the regulation. Is there anything else um, that they may need to know about um, these proposed, these provisions? Um, I mean, there's a lot of changes that are, are in those revisions. I mean, I think that the, the most substantial change is going to be to the consents, um, at least as it has to do with the workflow of a treatment facility. Mm -hmm. So I'd highly encourage people to, um, to go on to the federal registry and review those changes or to contact you for um, a, a summary of those part two proposed rules or myself um, as we have that summary that we created um, that they can actually have an at a glance look of these of these proposed changes. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, for um, helping us break down part two and telling us about um, the revisions and some of the important parts about it. And again, yeah, if you guys um, want to learn more about it, you can contact um, HIPAA-TREC. And um, how do they get in contact with you, Sarah? Yes, so my email address is sarah at hippotrek.com or my telephone number is 314-272-272. 2598. Okay, awesome. Thank you. And um, yeah, if you guys want to get in touch with us, you can um, email us at information at medavancebilling.com or you can uh, give us a call toll free at 1 888 407 9920.